I started drawing younger than I can remember, and I drew all the time. What I get from a comic, the way it works, the way it's put together, it's, it's unique. I've become fascinated by the way the visual narrative actually works, the way it flows, the way one picture leads into another one. This is Hope Street. Hope Street Studios. No puke today. This last year I've been working between six and seven days a week. Uh, I'm very often in here till last bus. And when it's near deadline, or if the work's just going really well, I'll sometimes just stay in. One of the projects that I'm working on just now is called Jupiter's Legacy. You've got older heroes from the 30s, they're altruistic, everything that they do, they do for the greater good. And then they've got these children and grandchildren who've simply grown up this way, the equivalent of your kind of Paris Hiltons. They've got superpowers and they're famous and they've got advertising contracts and they get invited to all the, the A-lister parties and all the rest of it, but they're a different generation, they've got a different mindset from the parents. When I get the first script in, it's always the same process for me. I read it and reread it until it becomes really quite clear in my mind. Even at that stage, you actually start making decisions about atmosphere and, and layout and the way you're going to put it together. I have to be thinking about the easiest, simplest way of making it clear what's happening, but it also has to be interesting, because sometimes the easiest, simplest way isn't, isn't visually very satisfying. Page 13, we've got, um, we've got a bunch of fire engines flying past, and our two heroes, Hutch and Jason, a father and son, are uh, walking up the street. Then the kid goes into a public lavatory, out the skylight window, and, and flies away. His name's Jason. So far in the script, he hasn't got a, a superhero name. This is the first thing that he's done. He's got changed and flown up into the sky. His father is the son of some famous supervillain, but he doesn't actually have powers himself. His mother's fully superpowered, but they don't actually know that he's out doing this. I've read the script often enough that I see the whole thing as a selection of still images, which I think are going to work best. But often I have more than one still image for each panel, and it's not always just a question of taking the still image that looks the best in isolation. You have to actually choose the still image that looks the best within the sequence. Sometimes I, I come up with it quite quickly and sometimes it takes ages, but irrespective, it always, it always takes a good long while to actually draw it up. Considerably longer than it takes to read it, and have a look at it as you're flicking through a comic. I was born in 1968. Uh, in Glasgow here. And I always loved drawing and I always, I always thought I was quite good, you know, like even when I didn't have anything to compare it to. I would say my single biggest influence from when I was younger was a, a Scottish artist, Dudley D. Watkins. He did the Bruins in Our Willie for decades and decades and Desperate Dan and lots of things. I used to read them in my grandparents' house on a Sunday. I was the best drawer in class in primary school and I was the best in my class at secondary school. And 
then I went to art school and then I started freelancing and then I drifted into comics. From the thumbnails on the, the script I make uh, page layouts, which I generally do digitally now. I'm going to have three skylights here and this one is going to be opened. So we'll have the boy going in here and a head and shoulders coming out here and then flying away in the distance. And then I'll have the cop standing here with his back to us and the guy in the hat standing here. And then we'll go to this shot of young Jason flying up towards us. I often draw it like that just to get the proportions right and then put his, his trousers in, you know, when I'm doing the final line work in pencil on paper. I've drawn out a character design for Jason wearing the, the white under armour that he wears for his, his soccer and he's got his rucksack that he just carries about with him anyway. So that's where his jeans and shirt go. He keeps his cons and socks on. So then the only really the only bit of kit that he actually has to put on really is the his wee homemade diamond mask and a, a bandana. The colours are chosen because they tie in with his grandfather who was the, the main character from the first three issues, the Utopian. The whole look is just kind of reminiscent of that. Grant sat and just ran through a casual synopsis for the whole thing and it just sounded amazing. It was pretty exciting, you know, and it was kind of, it was one of those moments. Classic 50s Superman was part of the aesthetic of it, but I also had to come up with a way of drawing Superman that was just natural to me. So it's just a kind of, this is what Superman looks like in my mind, but because it's me that's drawing it, it does have this kind of hint of in a desperate dan about it. It's quite a big story. It's, it's a big human drama, and um, it's about accepting your own mortality. Thanks to a, a cunning plan by Lex Luthor, uh, Superman ends up flying too close to the sun. His cells start uh, deteriorating. So it's kind of like the equivalent of cancer for him. So he realises he's got about a year to live, and uh, there's a number of things that he, he has to put in order before he dies. Since the dawn of modern humans, storytelling has been one of the main ways that we communicate ideas. In the same way that I'm sure soldiers going into war would tell stories about great heroes to G people up and inspire them, you know. Most fiction, most fictional characters are either kind of there for cautionary purposes or, or to inspire us, to be like role models for us. I mean, you do get drawn into what you're, you're drawing, of course. There's two issues of the 12 issue run that have Bizarro in them. Bizarro's the mad, upside down, topsy-turvy type Superman. And everything's just broken and back to front. I was actually at my most stressed when I was drawing those issues. The deadlines were completely short right from the start. There was the stress of that, but also the exchange rate between dollars and pounds was really poor at that point as well. And I thought I was going to lose the house and stuff like that, so it was, it was a really frantic time. I actually think the drawing's slightly, slightly looser and slightly more frantic in that, but I was certainly looser and more frantic when I was drawing it. Grant was delighted, of course. He was hoping I'd have a, a full breakdown to, <laughs> to, make, to make the issue really good. Two mods have just gone by in Lumbretas. I haven't seen a mod for ages. Because I'm drawing from my imagination all the time, there is a general look to most of the characters. I always think it's a bit like if you go to a family wedding and 
pretty much everybody in the room looks vaguely like another few people in the room. You know, there is a, there's just a, there's slightly too many connections for it to be anything other than a family wedding. I often like do wee sketches of people in the street or in the train station or on the bus or whatever. Sometimes it's for really simple things like just here's a convincing way that tired people sit when they're sitting in a bus. I know a lot of comic artists and, the, and they'll say, even if they're not trying to get a likeness, they'll be thinking in terms of like Clint Eastwood for this character or whatever, you know. But with me, it's, it tends more to be people I know or combinations of different people that I know. These are the roughs for the Walking Dead cover. She was based loosely on a teacher from my primary school. She seemed to me at the time, when I was like six or seven, she seemed like about 100 years old and she had horn rim glasses. She was incredibly skinny and wrinkly. So you told her it was on me? Well, you know, I thought, you know, like, it's that way, like, you know, you must get granny zombies, you know, so... I'm wanting the the city to be drawn with enough detail that it looks convincingly like a city from the air. But um, when it comes to colouring, I'll ask Peter to keep the, the line work of the foreground figure in solid black and drop the line work of the background back a bit so that there's there's a little bit more there's a little bit more of a distinction. When I'm working digitally it's very easy to change things and I don't feel precious about it. But when it comes to actually doing fine detail, even though this is a really sophisticated piece of technology, the feeling of being like, it's like trying to, it's like trying to touch your finger like against the glass and it never quite meets. There's something like that feeling when you're, when you're working with this. It's just not quite perfect. And um, the level of sensitivity you've got with the tip of a pencil on the paper, it's like there isn't a gap there at all. Ready to print this out in blue and then start uh, doing the finished line work. We've got eggs. Are you wanting eggs? Finn, can you boil the kettle? Yeah, sure. Hope Street Studios is it's, uh, it's a pretty nice place to work, you know. We have a slow kind of turnover of of people. Some people stay about for years, other people are just in for a few months and move on, but um, the way it goes, it's always word of mouth. All the people who've ended up here have been friends or colleagues of the people who already work here. You know, you can be a, you can be a tribute act or you can be inspired by various different sources and and uh, that helps shape you. As a teenager I had Katsuhiro Otomo, the Japanese guy that did uh, Akira. He was depicting a world that that had enough detail that it was entirely believable, you know, cities crumbling and there was a sense of scale and a sense of place. The fact that he didn't resort to sketching in areas of the city in the background that weren't actually depicted with some degree of accuracy. And I think that's one of the things that kind of really helped sell that whole world that he was presenting. Over the years, I've never managed to get any faster, even though I've become generally more efficient with all the different skills that I need. When I started out, it was all about just keeping things clear and easy to understand. And over the years, the more I've learned about storytelling, the more I've learned about the way you can lead the eye around the page, or the way you can encourage somebody to move very slowly from left to right across the panel. All this stuff I've become so kind of fascinated by and engrossed in the way it actually works. I find that I spend more and more time planning the pages than I do actually drawing up the, the finished artwork. This is the, the page from We Three that took a couple of weeks to work out.
To some extent it's about a relationship with technology and um, war and a relationship with animals and each other. The human characters were hardly in it. You know, we, we actually decided that we would try and have as few faces in it as possible. A bit like the Tom and Jerry cartoons where you would always just see the, the legs and feet. We had a number of other ideas about storytelling and kind of page construction and panel layout that we hoped would be kind of new and that would suggest the action playing out in a way that you we wouldn't normally perceive it. The idea of trying to come up with something that was aesthetically different but also, like more importantly, that actually worked differently in the way the visual narrative was presented. We hoped that that would also give this feeling that maybe this was kind of the way it would work for, for instance, a cat or a dog. The CCTV sequence was um, half a dozen pages of little frames like TV screens in a high security building where the animals are, are escaping from and the whole sequence is told mostly wordlessly just you know from multiple cameras. It was so difficult to fine tune it when I was trying to draw all those panels or redraw them all in different orders you know on separate bits of paper that I ended up cutting them up. I worked out this sequence of a hundred and however many um, individual drawings yeah, I mean, I have the geography of the building, or the relevant parts of the building in my mind. And um, so I drew each of the sequences from the, from the imaginary viewpoint of the cameras that I'd installed in those parts of the building. <laughs> I sound absolutely mad. You go to extraordinary lengths sometimes to try and make complicated things kind of simple and understandable, whether that's some kind of, if you're trying to sell some sort of emotional part of the story or if it's, it's just in terms of building up an atmosphere or a level of detail that helps make a, an environment believable. Um, you just, uh, you just ha you do a lot of thinking, you know, in order that the, the reader doesn't have to do any. <laughs> In this page from Jupiter's Legacy, there's this bad guy here who has got immense power and he's just blasted everybody away from him. And uh, this character, Walter, comes down. He can control people's minds to the point where he can put them into an environment of his choosing. What he's actually doing is creating a cell or creating a, a little world constructed from his thoughts. It's a fabrication. and. Um, my process is sketching out roughly in blue and then adding more detail and then going in um, with a black line. So what I ended up doing was a kind of cutaway type thing where you have a, a cube, like a prison cell, and as we go in from the front to the back, we actually go through the creative process of, of producing this image so that it echoes the creative process of him fabricating this little cell to to trap the, the bad guy. So this is me doing the finished line work on my blue underdrawing. This is where I'm making the decision about which, you know, where to, to make the line work slightly simpler and where to add a little bit more detail. Because they can be exaggerated characters or archetypal characters, I think they lend themselves quite well to to being used as as just vehicles for getting an idea across. You know, um, I heard that Superman sells better in um, times of economic depression. And Batman sells better um, in boom times. One of the theories I think is that when things are when things are bad. People are looking for a, a god figure or a father figure, you know, or a help from above kind of thing, somebody to come in and fix things. Whereas, like in the 80s, for instance, when, uh, when everyone was making money and people felt kind of powerful and self-assured, um, Batman seems to fit the kind of the zeitgeist better. He's a, 
that man's a self-made man. And what I can do is add porridge, eh, mm -hmm. do it with water, and then I add my milk in later. If you don't mind. No, not at all. Cheers. I don't know whether or not it's a good industry to grow old in. On the one hand, I suppose you can slowly keep getting better at what you do in a way that you can't if you're a footballer, but then you've got the problem of falling out of fashion, just not really being in step anymore, and there's an element of that in comics. Brilliant, somebody's out there in silver hot pants. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm doing this, um, although it looks like I'm only tracing over it, I'm actually making little modifications, I'm just kind of fine tuning it because the blue lines are going to get stripped out, so all that's going to be left are the marks I'm making just now. Mostly I quite like working late. I usually get slightly more um, slightly more done at night time. You know, sometimes like if I'm working late at night I can be I can be thumbnailing or or doing page layouts or whatever and um, I can be potting around with the same problem and not being able to solve it for ages. But when I'm doing the finished line work like this like because all the decision making has been made it's just adding detail and, and texture and extra layers of information and making things clearer and you know it's 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 really a fairly kind of not quite automatic but it's it doesn't require a great deal of thought it just needs a wee bit of concentration almost every day I get to a point where the drawing goes really quickly and just really flows and it happens more often at night time than during the day. Sometimes I go out for a walk and even when you're trying not to think about the, the problem you're wrestling with or the piece of work that you've left behind that you're about to go back to, the experiences you're, you're getting while you're walking around end up influencing like you're drawing a futuristic city, and rather than just googling futuristic looking things, uh, sometimes it's good to just go out and walk around and, and see what's actually out there, and what's actually out there is like funny looking street cleaning vehicles that look like bugs and you know, like bin lorries and stuff. The world I live in, in some ways it's, it's a far cry from drawing a city in some future world, but at the same time, quite apart from the fact that Glasgow's a pretty colourful place to, to live, there's certain things that are kind of universal. The way people interact with each other, you know, the way people act in the, the morning commute whenever everybody's trying to get to work, and the way they're acting at the, the end of the night. These things are kind of universal. Everything about the, the world around me and my life is something that I can draw on. get a few hours sleep then often what I do is I'll get up and do some more work and go and get a shower in Central Station and then work for another few hours during the day and then go home kind of like late afternoon or dinner time. It's funny because I used to get the, the showers in the stations and think what kind of people use the showers in Central Station <laughs> and, uh, and now I know. This is a semi-supine position. You stand against the wall upright and you measure the space between the back of your head and the wall. That's the number of books you need under your head. Normally it's, it's three Akira's or six Akira books and they're all slightly different thicknesses, so 
Uh, for me, I've got to pick the right three. For years, I worked in the house. I had a studio in the house, and um, and it was nice, and it was really convenient. It was really convenient to be able to get out of your bed and make a pot of coffee. And then, about eight years ago or so, um, I rented a desk just for a couple of months. And as soon as soon as I got to the studio, my wife just started packing up my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't believe how, how good it was to get rid of me. I'm incredibly messy. I mean, like the uh, this is the this is the tidiest I've ever kept my workspace. That's only because I'm sharing a room with two other people. Nearly there, yeah. Um, this is me just finishing off the the detail in the cityscape in the background. Ideally, you you want to be a couple of months ahead but I rarely am. Only ever at the start of a project. Uh, it's half four, um, and uh, I'm going to go to bed. I'm sleeping bag here. Good night. See you in the morning. Yeah, I slept well. It was quite, it was quite a short sleep. <laughs> um, comics aren't the best paid of the creative industries. I could make more money getting into the games industry or magazine illustration or do storyboarding or whatever. It doesn't matter how high up you are in the storyboarding game or the computer games, character design department or whatever. The fact is you're a tiny cog in a huge machine rather than being one of only a couple of cogs. And that appeals to me more. And what you're doing in a comic is you're putting something down that can't, doesn't really work in a film, doesn't really work in prose. The more I understand about how they work, the more I realise like how unique they are.